Hello and welcome to this week's Health Tech Hour with me, Steve Roost. Each week we bring you the best news, views and interviews with the leaders, clinicians, CEOs and founders that are who are changing the face of healthcare in the UK and beyond. As regular listeners know, I am the founder and CEO of a health tech business myself called PocDoc, which is revolutionizing digital pathways for cardiometabolic and renal conditions, um, working across pharmacy and the wider NHS. This actually is our first live show of 2024. So I hope everybody listening had a great break, um, great New Year's, great Christmas. Um, I, I can't actually decide whether I had a holiday or not, but it was definitely nice to see friends and family during the period. So it feels good to be back in the chair, good to be back doing our live show. So thank you very much um, to everyone for tuning in. We ended 2023 on an incredible high. We had record listeners, um, record listeners numbers across the board. So we were doing over 60,000 listeners a week uh, through our wonderful platform, UK Health Radio. We love the UK Health Radio team, Johan and everyone there. Um, thank you so much for providing us with this live platform. We were doing thousands and thousands of downloads every month across all of the um, podcast channels. And we are now officially being listened to in over 50 countries. And we actually added the People's Republic of China um, in the uh, final months of the year, which is a great addition to have. So thank you very much if you're listening from any of the countries, including um, the People's Republic of China. And thank you very much to everyone listening live. Thank you to everyone who's listening on demand. You can get our show on any of the podcast channels. So Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, Audible, all that stuff, you can find ours. And you can also find on the UK Health Radio channel, you can find all UK Health Radio uh, um, uh, shows as well. So there's, uh, there's shows all the time. They've got great content. Please check out all of those. So on to today's show. Today's show, we have Steve Sawyer, who is Managing Director of Access Health Support and Care who are one of the largest providers of digital care services to the NHS across the UK. Steve is also a trustee of a charity called SNAP, which stands for Special Needs and Parents. Steve, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you for inviting me on. I am very well, thank you. As you say, it's, it's, I think it's nice to be back in the chair. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's that, that kick off, off we go again, get, get, the, uh, get the engine motoring. Yeah. And, uh, you know, see how fast we can go. Yeah, exactly. It's always like, I feel like the first day's back, at, it's like a first day back at school. It's trying, <laughs> yes. to, it's trying, it's trying to remind yourself about how everything works. And then you realize that actually it's it's less hard working than it was, um, you know, being with your family over Christmas. <laughs> In some ways, not always, obviously. It's great to see friends and family, um, yeah. but, 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 you know, tricky. So anyway, good to have you on the show. Um, where I'd like to start with, because because, uh, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but access, health and care support services may not necessarily be a brand that all listeners are familiar with. You know, may, we're a broad church. We've got listeners yep. in the profession. We've got listeners out of the profession. Why don't we just start with what it is that that company does and, and your role in it? And I think particularly, we always like on the show to try and make it relevant back to why this matters to patients, you know, so not just talking about what the company does but actually why that matters because actually the business in yourself has been on an incredible journey over the last 10 to 12 years uh, at the forefront really of the digitization of care services within the NHS which obviously matters to everybody listening because we're all interacting with healthcare more digitally uh, and therefore and, we'll, and that will accelerate so anyway over to you. Okay that's great thank you uh, and, and don't worry I'm not insulted by that um, so uh so Access Health Support and Care is a dedicated division working in uh, health, local government and care. And by care, I'm talking not only social care, I'm talking about care providers themselves. So we're, we're a broad church ourselves. Um, uh, and we are one of the largest divisions within the Access Group. And the Access Group is one of the largest and leading providers of software solutions uh, in the UK, that we're across the UK, Ireland and Asia Pacific, as well as some other locations as well. Um, we're a, a, a fairly large organisation, about 7,000 employees uh, across the entire group. Um, and we basically we work in a, in a set of um, specialist markets, whether that is legal, recruitment, not for profit, education, um, payments, people, uh, ERP, financials, you name it, and of course in, in my specialist area, which is uh, health support and care. 
within uh, health support and care. Um, we work across the full um, care spectrum, or we call it the care continuum. Um, uh, so that means if I give you an example, we work with about 200 local authorities um, with their commissioning services, with their um, care market management, uh, reporting, with education, special, edu uh, special educational needs, uh, youth justice, um, brokerage, so a whole range of, of services around that. We work with about 45, 50 NHS trusts in um, largely mental health. There's community health in there as well. Um, we work with some 10,000 registered care providers as well. So um, that, that ranges from the very small startup uh, owner managed um, domiciliary provider or single care home right through to the largest of the networks uh, that are out there. So it's a, it's a pretty broad spectrum. Okay. And where, I know it's a very broad spectrum and we'll dig into it a little bit at the, at the time, but you joined, I think, the business when it wasn't really doing very much digital healthcare at all. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. So I joined in 2013. Um, I, I've been in software for about 20 years or so, started out originally uh, client side with uh, working in a professional body, um, in a, a body that was 50 years old the year that I joined. Okay. Um, and this is this is back early days of the Internet, 1997. So we're still still talking dial up modems and, and you know, a website that we checked once a week, checked our email box once a week, that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I was very interested in in digitizing and taking the organization digitally, which which we did. And then I moved into um, directly sort of provider side uh, thereafter, software provider side thereafter. So um, I joined Access Group in uh, 2013. Mm -hmm. And um, within one of the organizations that, that we just brought into the group, because we are we, we grow organically and, and we are, we're acquisitive, um, one of the organizations that had recently uh, come into the fold was a company called People Planner which was a relatively small rostering provider in the care sector. Um, now, I'd, I'd always worked in not-for-profit and care, so a lot of personal interest in that area. And I think it's a great thing, and I'm sure you'll you'll feel the same way. Same way. There's lots of areas you can work in, in software, and you're mm -hmm. working software, and you're providing to businesses, et cetera. We have that, that added brisson that added excitement that added satisfaction of, of wearing two hats we've got our our tech hat and we've got our kind of social good hat yeah uh, I'm, a, I'm a you know a real real big believer in that so um that was very attractive to me uh this this business of people planner and we brought that together with a, another acquisition working in care homes and then launched the division as health support and care in 2014 uh pretty small at the time i think we were probably about 30 30 people working in uh, largely in care. So the health support and care moniker, Scanned Well, was a great yeah. name, um, but primarily we were care. Um, and really what we, what we looked to do was grow out the, the offering of what we could do in the care market for care providers at a point when you're right, it, it wasn't terribly digital out there. It was very young. There were lots and lots of majority of providers had no systems. Uh, electronic systems. Care planning was very, very young in terms of being a digital service. Um, and so we spent that period uh, running right through up until sort of 2020, growing out the offerings that we had within care um, so that we could provide a, a fuller suite of solutions, really with the aim of, of making care providers' lives easier so they didn't have to worry so much about the administration, about the logistics, about the payroll, about the invoicing, about all of that sort of stuff, and could really focus on delivering care. Because at the end of the day, that's that's what you yeah. want to do if you work in the sector. So um, we grew that that element out from there, um, and then um, really sort of started moving across along the care continuum. And I've used that that phrase a couple of times, and I'll, and I'll use it some more because I think. The some of the issues that we see, and, and these are well known, is it's it's a pretty disjointed sector, pretty disjointed community, mm. health and care. Um, you know, the fact that there is a dividing line, there's a health and and care. Yeah, why is there that? That's a great point. I've never thought too hard about that. Why is there? It, why is it health and care? I so they're very, they're they're quite different things. You know, the delivery of care and the delivery of health are quite different things. They're funded in different ways. 
in lots of ways, care has been the poor cousin for a long time. Um, it hasn't received the same level of funding, the same level of focus. But in reality, I believe it is the, the route to solving the cost and capacity crisis that we have. Because okay. actually, and I'm sure we'll get to this later on, actually what we've got to do is look at saying, how do we stop people or how do we slow down the advancement of people entering into an acute setting, to a healthcare setting, a medical clinical setting? How do we do that? Well, mm. you know, we can do that in a in a cheaper setting, which is not health, uh, within within care, within the community, um, with third party uh, third sector providers as well, for example. And then, if somebody does go into that acute setting, into that health setting, that clinical setting, how quickly can they move out of there? And not need readmission. So for you, is the so health for you is the clinical setting. Is the clinical Cute. setting. Is, is, is care aware. is care care is preventative or care is non-acute or a bit of uh, both. I, I, yeah, I mean, yes. We, obviously, the lines are very very blurred, and, and health is not just acute. No, it, okay. It, I'm just it's primary, and secondary, etc. Within that, but but yes, for for me, if if I put a, a sort of a, a a more clinical dividing line. There's plenty of clinical that takes place in a in a care sure. environment as well. I guess I'm sort of saying out of hospital, in right. hospital, out, out of hospital is a key okay. line. So um, for us, as we look along that that sort of journey, we 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 were and are working with a, a, a huge number of care providers. And when you look at the sort of the issues that come through that, the, the next part that comes to it is if you're providing care, where is that requirement for care coming from? Well, the next step of it actually is coming through from, from local authorities. It's the commissioning piece to it. And so we then stepped into commissioning and monitoring with a view to saying, you know, can we help to make that more efficient? Can you have a better flow of data between the, the requirement and request for care provision and then out into the care provision itself? Um, and then uh, you asked me about brand names earlier, and yeah. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not here advertising or anything like that. But but maybe it'll be helpful brand names wise. Um, if if our care side of things, people will know the likes of of um, People Plan or Access Care Planning if they work in in the care space, or Access Care and Compliance and Access Policies and Procedures. It's easy because the clues in the access bit at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I, I got the trend. You got, yeah. got the trend there. Um, so if we move move along into the commissioning side. Um, uh, brand names that would have been known out there would be things like CM or Care Monitoring or CM2000 or HAS technology. Okay. So we brought that uh, into the fold. And then pretty rapidly after that, we stepped along to say, right, if you really want to join the dots here, and this, by the way, was, was as we were coming into and going through the whole COVID piece, um, if you really want to join the dots there, you've then got to bring, absolutely bring health into the fold and bring local government into the fold. So that means moving along into the social care record, moving into social prescribing, moving into health systems, whether that's, you know, health health case management or um, uh, electronic patient records, for example. Right. So and, and, sorry, and, and just in terms of brand, again, you've asked names that people would know out there would be uh, Servalec. So Servalec we brought into, into the fold with, with products like Rio or Mosaic or Synergy or Core Plus and then elemental on the social prescribing side. Okay. And so when we talk about care, or when you're talking about care, we're not talking about care homes, right? We're talking about the broadest sense of care across any type of spectrum, right? Just to clarify. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The broad, broadest sense of that. And now a good deal of that is, yes, it's in, it's in care homes or it's in home care, or right. it may well be straightforward uh, community-based services, which are not necessarily delivered by, by care workers. These are often uh, volunteer based services, charity based services. Um, and we we particularly see that involved where where we provide social prescribing or where we're supporting organizations to provide social prescribing. I think that's got a really big role moving forwards. Well let's talk, let's talk about social prescribing, seeing as you bring it up, because it's a bit of a buzzword and it probably gets kicked around a fair bit. And there might be some people listening who have heard about it either on the news or in different media outlets and it, you know it, it gets talked about a fair bit. Um, how would you define social prescribing? Oh, great, great, great question, because I think social prescribing is now starting to expand out into a, a, a number of, of settings. So um, when I first came across social prescribing, it was very much that concept of, I'll give you an example, let's say um, we've got a, a um, 
middle-aged guy who's slightly overweight, who's drinking too much, smoking too much, socially isolated, mm -hmm. um, and they go to see their doctor because there's there's some health issues that are there. The reality is that with all those sort of social determinants, they're, they're isolated, they're not perhaps looking after their own well-being so well, that's going to end up eventually in a, in a health situation. Mm -hmm. Well, social prescribing is a great route. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, sort of a use case here of a, of a GP actually sitting down with, we'll call him John, and saying to John, you know what, John, we haven't got a problem right now, but you do need to reduce your, your smoking, you do need to reduce your your drinking, you need to get out and exercise, you need to be seeing people. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to link you up, I'm going to use a link work, I'm going to put you in touch with local services that can support in that. And that might well be some form of social group, it might well be um, a, a, you know, a, a, a charity that supports on smoking, it might well be um, financial ser uh, advice services, let's say, let's say there's, there's a financial situation there, for example, it's a whole series of, of um, interactions that can take place in the community to help John to look after himself better, to access resources that are out there. Um, now, historically, pre-digital, you will have somebody who's going to, you know, maybe maybe the doctor's going to hand to to John, here's a list of some local charities. Yeah, or a leaflet or something. Or a leaflet, exactly. And the likelihood is John is not going to follow up on that. There is no follow-up to it. There's no measure of success for it. There's no great register of services that's available out there. Um, it is unmeasurable, and, and therefore you don't get, get the follow-up to it. So um, what you've now got is, is digital systems. We, we provide one. There are others. And so Elemental is the system that, that we provide. And what that does is it effectively enables somebody from the GP to actually refer directly out to those services. And the important thing there is, that is then picked up directly by that service who can contact John, encourage him to get involved and actually help him to take control of his own well-being. And, that, and that's the important thing, actually, is that sort of self-activation piece to right. it. Um, but presumably this requires those services to actually exist. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and But you know what? I don't think there's a there's a lack of those services. There's a lack okay. of funding for those services. Right. But there's 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 a lot of a lot of services out there, a huge amount of services out there, many of which are actually um, one of their biggest challenges is, is the outreach to say, hey, we're here, use okay. us, we're available, come and, you know, come and join in um, and we can help you because they are there to help. And when did this concept of social prescribing start to gain momentum? Because like on the one hand, it's always been there, the leaflet, the have you spoken to these people? Have you, you know, have the, I think there's someone that can help you. You know, yeah. but when did it start to become a defined term, you know, with a capital S, capital P? Oh, uh, you, you've got me. I'd, I'd have to ask my specialist colleagues in this area. <laughs> or like um, generally, I mean, like order of yeah, magnitude. Yeah, you know? um, well, I mean, we're, we're talking, it, it is a, a number of years now. Um, I think there are link workers in, in pretty much every area that, mm -hmm. that are sort of funded link workers. The challenge really is is their capacity to deal with everybody that they need to deal with. So yeah, right. Like it's sort of like because because the thing that the, the about the NHS is a little. Have you have you heard of the story about um, this? Might be apocryphal, by the way. Yeah. Um, in which case, I apologise. But um, do you remember when those burger chains were popping up? The the you know the the Shake Shacks and the Five Guys and the all yeah. this type of stuff. McDonald's was coming under a huge amount of pressure because the quality. The relative quality was enormous. Yep. The gap was huge. And they were like, why can't McDonald's do organic burgers? And why can't McDonald's do this? And the, the CEO of McDonald's got up and was like, look, if we make a single change to our menu, we have to make that across all of our restaurants in any given country, which means it's not just a question of being able to, you know, make a few hundred organic burgers. We need to figure out how to make organic burgers for millions of millions of people. Otherwise, we can't make the change. And so I wonder whether it's a little bit like, I've just, you know, without wishing to relate it back so, so brutally, but you know, if, if you're, you, you could, is it either a binary choice, either the service is offered to everyone that would qualify or it's only offered until the point that that service is full. Do you see what I mean? Uh, yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, it's I know a, I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. It's more of no, a discussion no, point. It's, it's, it's a, it's a great question. Look, all services are, are finite. Right. Eventually, 
I, I think it's it's one of the interesting things is that when you when you look at the NHS and and uh, and broader health and care at the moment, the biggest problem is is capacity. Yeah, and that is that is demand is huge. Yeah, supply is limited. Obviously, staffing recruitment is is a big challenge. So the thing you've got to look at is how do you create capacity? Because with the best will in the world, we are not going to magic up an extra half a million staff. It, it's not happening. No, that's physically we're, impossible. We've got to pay for them anyway. They're, they're not there and we and we can't pay them. So uh, that's not the answer. So it is about ways of creating capacity or ways of deferring, delaying that higher level of need and reducing that. Yeah, I think it's a so social prescribing, as I understood it, was and I'm sure there's evidence, I, I sort of understand it, you know, anecdotally, I haven't actually looked into the clinical evidence, but that I, from what I understand, the kind of view is that it's more effective or as effective, if not more effective than potentially, I don't know, putting someone on statins or, you know, or, or it can be done alongside it to make it more um, effective or whatever. It's, it's like a, there's, there's clinical evidence to suggest that actually a, a non-pharmaceutical intervention is effective in certain circumstances, which makes total sense as long as those services exist, yeah. basically. Yeah, no, no. So you're absolutely right. I think there's 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 two parts to it. I, I said there that when I first came across it, it was it was sort of on the the preventative side. Yeah, it might be uh, you know, um, are you going to exercise and and cut your cholesterol and improve your diet, or are you going to take statins and maybe it's yeah. not a choice of either or. But um, what we're seeing increasingly is the use of social prescribing on the other side of that equation as well. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work with uh, the Life Rooms, and the Life Rooms is a social, pri uh, social prescribing service um, from Merseycare NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and this is an interesting one because... So presumably this is in and around the Liverpool area. Exactly, yes. Uh, and And... With the, the trust there, the, the interesting part of this is, is all about the integration and pulling of these things together. So um, with Mersey Care, we work with them uh, in their mental health service. And then they've got Life Rooms social prescribing. So what happens when you bring those two things together? OK, so let's assume you are a, a clinician working in a mental health service. Somebody that's coming into that mental health service is likely to have a whole mix of issues that need dealing with. There are clinical issues, there will be some external factors that are impacting those mental health issues. Social issues, again, isolation, deprivation, all of these kind of social determinants here. And um, what tends to happen, or what often happens, for example, in a mental health service, is yes, you want to deal with the, the clinical aspect to it, but a huge amount of the conversation is around those other aspects as well, non-clinical pieces, that need to be dealt with. So what uh, Mersey Care have, have um, run this, this project, bringing together the, the trust and uh, life rooms, and indeed they've just done a, a whole year long um, study on it. Mm -hmm. So they've done an analysis of this across, um, was it St. Helens, Knowlesley, Halton and Warrington. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's, there's uh, four, four boroughs that they've done the study across. And what they're really doing there is having the clinical conversation, the clinical setting, and then they are able directly via system, so digitally, to refer that individual out to the other community-based services, voluntary services, et cetera. So the social side of it is handled in the right place in a non-clinical setting. Now, they did that previously, as many would do, but it would have been done in an analog way. It will have been phoning round. It will have been recommending services, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, what they've what they've seen through the analysis, I'm, uh, this will be a study that we published in due course. What they've seen through the analysis is clinicians themselves are citing savings of one to three hours per patient of wow, time saved. Great. And they are able to start co-producing, life rooms are able to start co-producing a, a self-care package, if you like, with the individual and have that monitored to see that actually somebody does get involved in those other aspects that are going to support them, whether that is uh, financial advice, whether it is tying, it, tying up with, with a, you know, a social community or whatever it yeah. may be within that. So they're seeing um, savings in clinical time, 
Savings in clinical time, is, it's never going to be a saving in money. What it is is a saving in capacity. That's three hours that could be spent with other people. Yeah. So we're creating capacity in that way. And for the individual themselves, well, actually, this isn't now, right, I've got a, um, a, a fixed time burst of support from an acute service, and now I'm jettisoned at the end of it. And by the way, when I'm jettisoned at the end of it in two months' time, you know, yeah, I'm just getting I'm, I'm straight admitted. back into the yeah, acute exactly. setting. So, yeah. so you can stop those readmissions or reduce those readmissions. No, I think I like I think it's a really we've got to go for a break, quick commercial break, because we're well overdue and 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 my producer's <laughs> waving his finger at me. But I think what's what's really interesting about this area is is that it it um it addresses a lot of the issues that appear to be present in like you say either the analog or trying to fit an acute model into some pathways which where it doesn't fit because it's not an acute condition it's not an yep. acute problem mental health um you know lifestyle issues isolation whatever it might be financial issues um and actually understanding that there's this interconnection between these different issues that impact people's health that can't be solved with a pharmaceutical intervention so i know i think it's a really interesting area so we will go for our first break um, and we will be right back with Steve Sawyer, who is the Managing Director of Access Health, Access Health Support and Care. And um, we'll be right back to continue the discussion on this week's Health Tech Hour. See you soon. Hello and welcome back to this week's Health Tech Hour with me, Steve Roost, and my guest, Steve Sawyer, who is the Managing Director of Access Health Support and Care, who are one of the largest providers of digital care services across the NHS. So before the break, we were getting deep into this idea of social, social prescribing, which um, is a really interesting area fundamentally and, and a really, I think, pragmatic approach to solving issues of health as opposed to this sort of sick care model. Um, the next, but the, the, the interesting piece that I want to sort of pick up there, um, which I know is something that you guys work on, have worked on or do work on, is around mental health and how digital technology can be used or is being used to address what has been referred to as a sort of mental health service crisis at times in different parts of the media, into the, the tra industry trades, um, you know, across different areas of the of, of of the service. So, how how have you guys been involved in that, and what's your view on how digital technology can be used to it, or has been, or is being used to improve? mental health uh pathways for patients yeah okay um so yeah i mean there's there's a lot a lot sort of written about this and, and the mental health crisis and i think this is this is one of those things plainly again i i hate keep on talking about covid but you know what it's it's so impactful for for where we are now why we are where we are now part of the piece that that came out of of covid of course is that it it really helped to advance um, this idea of remote services and digitalization. That's, yep. that's a great thing. Um, and it's increased um, waiting times. That's a bad thing, but uh, necessity breeds invention. So that's a good thing for advancing uh, digitalization. And of course, it's it's caused uh, the government to to actually throw some throw some money at trying to make some changes and, and reforming services. I mean, um, and I, and I, I think that you know, there's a pretty general, there's a pretty widespread view that it brought the digital health, remote monitoring, virtual wards, virtual patient monitoring world on by you know ten years or whatever. Yeah, it is. I mean, there's some like, yeah, you know, before COVID, it seemed like there was still a big, big, big debate about telehealth, for example. Yes. Yep. And 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 whereas now I don't really think there's that much of a debate. It's more around how do we use this and what instances and how do we tweak it and how do we adapt to it? Not like, well, I just completely disagree with the concept. It, no, exactly right. Exactly right. So um, it has absolutely moved things on by leaps and bounds. Um, mental health is one of those areas um, that is positively impacted by this. And it needs to be because so many people have been negatively impacted from a mental health perspective by by uh, sort of what's what's gone on um so digital has a huge role to play in this you talked there about sort of um uh, telehealth and, and monitoring 
I think we've got a, um, there's two catalysts, three, two, three catalyst events actually that taking place here. One of them was that realization that, that you can do more digitally, you can do more with remote monitoring, that sort of piece. That's, that's, that's a big one. And that is driven both um, in terms of general care delivery, pre-health delivery, and then your virtual ward situation. Mm. Um, and then the, the other tie into it, of course, is gonna be the uh, analog to digital switchover. So there's a there's a, a a simple logistical it's not simply in any way um, logistical change there which is by the end of 2025 analog is you know analog is getting turned off right. and most of things like your social alarms that are out there um, were analog. So all wait, what? Hold up, hold up a second. What analog services are getting switched off? I'm not sure I know what you mean. So your analog telephone services. Oh, okay. Are getting okay. turned off. It's, it's all right. going digital. Hence, open reach vans being all over the place, which right. over, gotcha. over your telephone lines. And um, the important point to that, the important factor there is that most social alarms that were out there in the world, out there in the UK, um, run on the analog network. It, we, we're talking about the... Um, we're the talking about buttons, buttons, buttons and boxes and pull cords. Yeah. Pull cords. Okay. Now, there are millions of them out there. Yeah. And they are a pretty rudimentary way of supporting somebody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, you've got a combination of factors going on here. We've got the analog to digital switchover. If we're going digital, it means you can do a lot more than just a button and box. Mm -hmm. Come to that one in a second. Um, so you've got that piece. And then you've got the understanding that actually we could do more monitoring wise to uh, prevent or predict um, care outcomes. Yeah. And you've got the advent of, of AI actually starting to take off and machine learning uh, sort of maturing within that. So um, what we are seeing is you talked about mental health. There are things like people have got, you know, th their apps where they can feed back on that. How am I feeling today? How am I doing today? Mm. Just getting that information back to a clinician, to a team that can be monitored so we can understand, hang on a minute, this individual is suddenly going to need an intervention. We can we can intervene now. Now, that's that's active, um, active intervention. Somebody's showing signs that they're going to need some more support. Okay. But actually, what we're seeing through... Um, implementing uh, organizations now implementing digital monitoring in place of just the the button which is of course a key part of it still um what you're seeing now is the ability to put further monitoring in a home or on an individual so a wearable that somebody's out with or in people's homes we're not talking here cameras we're not talking intrusive mm. we're we're talking simple environmental monitoring or it may well be just understanding whether the front door has been opened or closed or whether somebody's gone into the bathroom or not, or you know whether somebody's turned the kettle on, for example. And the reason that is important is if you imagine somebody is, is out there in their own home, it's quite hard to understand exactly what's going on. Are they going to go into a decline? Are they going to need some form of health intervention? The, the real typical one, um, particularly in aged care, is a UTI, a urinary tract yeah. infection. And there are some pretty clear signs of that one coming, you know, and lots of examples are used. And whether let's, let's use the example of somebody who's getting up in the night, they, they're going to the toilet a lot, they're not drinking as much. These are a, a typical sort of signs that might come through. You don't know of those until somebody hits an acute situation. They hit a situation where there's going to need to be some form of medical intervention. Yeah. The signs are way before that. And unless that individual is articulating that they've got an issue, and you know, this is quite a personal thing, it's a private thing, they're not yeah. that likely to do it. How do you spot it? Well, actually, now, if you've got monitoring in the home and, and, and there are tens of thousands or starting to be hundreds of thousands of these uh, devices out there now, where actually you have machine learning in place. So you've got a system. Somebody's got these, these, the monitoring in the home and you've got a system in place which learns their normal patterns of living, their normal daily patterns. So when usually, what's the window of time they usually go to bed, they get up, you know, do they get up at night to, to use the, the toilet or not? How often do they make a drink? All of those kind of things. And then using that machine learning and AI, you can now start automatically to see where there are changes in the trend. Where are the differences in that norm? Because if we see those trend changes, suddenly you can predict and prevent much of it. I mean, I think in theory, that's good. I mean... All of this stuff around gathering data and gathering data, actually, weirdly, I sort of think that the gathering data bit is the easy bit. It's the analysis. 
it, yeah, it, well, yeah, it's it's a the analysis and b that there's actually a pathway somewhere yep. where that data set is is put into that pathway, and then there's a step that says, right, I'm going to look at this data. Something, someone, or something is going to look at that data set. And if it looks like this, this is the action that will happen. If it looks like that, that's the action that's going to happen. I think that's one of the things that, you know, certainly from our time at PocDoc and one of the reasons why we've been so focused on delivering whole digital pathways is that we realize that sometimes just the test isn't enough or a lot of the time the actual test itself just isn't enough. Yeah. And there's lots and lots and lots and lots of different businesses across different sectors that provide the ability to gather data on different things. But actually understanding how that fits into a pathway that can actually be, um, uh, what's the word, actually actioned on at scale effectively yes. is really hard. So, yeah, absolutely right. I think there's, there's you, you always need the monitoring element to it, i.e. The, the end result, somebody needs to be alerted to those changes or yeah. to, be, to be looking at the data. Now, ideally, they're not just looking at the data. They need to be alerted to the thing that's different. I'm going to yeah. give you a simple example, and this again is about creating capacity. And this is about um, end user engagement. So family members, that, that wider support network engaging in somebody's uh, health and well-being. Yeah. So for example, um, we've got facilities whereby if somebody's got this monitoring in the home, uh, I can have on my app, my personal mobile, as yeah. son of somebody that has this, I can put on there um, for the system to alert me with things that comfort me and things that concern me. So okay. I'm going to get concerned if the front door is opened after 10 o'clock at night, or if it's open, it doesn't get closed again, or if there's something that is unusual in the pattern. Uh, my relative is not getting up in the morning, or they okay. haven't. So does this, do just, this, this exists? You this guys are doing world, this? This is real world out oh, there cool. with, with thousands and thousands of users. Okay. So, and equally, I want comfort. I want to know. Dad did get up this morning. It's okay. He's made his cup of tea. He's okay. I'm okay. I can get on with my life as well. You know what? That's reducing my stress. That's and how? Um, where is this being used, and and what are the results? Uh, so used very very widely um, across the UK. Um, we see it uh, directly implemented by uh, individuals, but more often than not, now what you've got is um, particularly local authorities who are using that catalyst of the analog to digital switchover to say, you know what, I'm going to replace my social alarms, but I'm going to add more. I'm going to okay. put in that additional service because right. the wider family group is able to support that individual, not just us as a local authority. Okay. And then um, I think in particular, without naming a particular uh, London authority that we're working with, who are very much looking at the changes in pattern to say, okay. well, this, is, this should cause an intervention right now. Are we still at the point where, though, we need to, you need to... We, we need to learn because we're still at the beginning of gathering all of the data are we still gathering the data to then determine when to make interventions because we're still at the beginning of the curve if that makes sense yeah yeah no, yeah, no, no. one's gathered this data at scale before so we don't really know enough now to be able to determine or, or yeah no I, th I think there's two elements to it there's gonna it, it will mature it will absolutely mature and ai um will come into play where you're saying right I, i've got much much larger data models yeah, and I can therefore become much more predictive uh, earlier on in the cycle. Yes, that yeah. that has yet to come. the The simple piece of machine learning of saying somebody's pattern has changed, and I'm seeing these indicators. That's very easy, and that is right now. Right, I'm doing that right now. So, so you can have a system which can learn somebody's pattern. It, it learns it, you know, it, with increasing. I, intelligence. I think the 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 idea, the, the idea yeah. for like a vulnerable person. And their family being able to tell if they left the front door open after ten o'clock at night, that is like makes total sense to me. I, 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 I that's a completely. I mean, that's a, that's a very clear upgrade on the, um, pull the emergency cord or not concept. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think there's. I'll give you another example when I say, and I think this is this is what comes into play when you look at things like virtual wards and how you're going to look after people in their own homes. And you want to start sending back clinical readings as well, and you want to understand that somebody is okay just to ensure that you deliver the right level of health or care intervention at the right time to the right person. There yeah. is so much intervention that takes place that is is too early. It's not needed. We've got a lot of waste there. It's too late. 
We could have yeah. done it earlier and, and had it less costly. Or you know what? We've got we've got sixteen thousand people today sitting in hospital beds that don't need to be there. They could be at home. They could be being looked after if we had the monitoring in place and and that that information is flowing back. So there's lots and lots of usages for it. Makes sense. A simple one, and this this came from um, a large uh, care provider. They they service local authority contracts. They do private. Um, and they also work with their local NHS trust as well. So they're, they're dealing with patients on sort of step down care or re care. And one of the issues that they have, again, this is around capacity, is people request and commission services all in the same blocks. So what right. I mean by that is, I say, right, okay, I need somebody to go in and see this person for a wake up. They're going to get them out of bed, sort their breakfast, meds, whatever it might be. And they commission everybody between seven and nine in the morning. Okay. And then lunch is, you know, for everybody, it's between 12 and, and 1. And then dinner is at whatever time. Right. That is a big problem because if you are, and that's a problem in, you know, whether that's a hospital, whether it's a, a community-based health service, whether it's a care service, because what you're doing is you're creating these huge peaks and troughs of when you need people. Yeah, it's like the, yeah, exactly. You're, yes, that makes total sense. Yeah. So how about because we have that in-home piece, I can see that Mary, I'm going to use Mary in this instance, Mary actually gets up at 6 in the morning. Yeah, that carer turning up at eight is two hours too late. And yeah. you know what? As a care provider, I've got capacity at six in the morning. Right. Eight o'clock is really hard. Well, like we've solved dynamic scheduling in loads, if not all other industries, right? No one care. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But that, but that's that's that, that's the quick. That's the case in so many different instances. Is just trying to apply what works in other industries to care, health and care yeah. is 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 the challenge so we have to go for our final break now yeah. um so we will be back with the final part of this week's health tech hour with my guest steve sawyer who is the managing director of access health and care we will be right back hello and welcome back to this week's health tech hour with me steve roost and my guest steve sawyer the managing director of access health and care so before the break we were really cracking on with the discussion around how digital technology can be used to improve the lives of many people across the UK. I want to sort of move a little bit more um, macro now, I would say. And what's your view around the, you know, the, the, the discrepancy between the sort of view that's perpetrated in the media around the NHS in perpetual crisis versus the huge and probably unprecedented amount of innovation, growth, excitement new ideas new visions new ways of doing things that is happening on the ground within the nhs so how, how do you reconcile both those things and what, what's your view on that uh, it's a great question um so look i i started my career um working doing doing pr for pr uh, back in the ab fab days yeah I, okay I, so that's I, like a, that's kind of existential right it, it is ex yes yeah yeah meta pr that was meta, that was, exactly was, meta pr do yes. public relations for the public relations sector at the time of of patty and eddie okay um and uh so i i had a somewhat um baptism of fire and let, let, dare i say slightly jaded view of the media mm -hmm. um and of of the press uh, press in particular i shouldn't say that they won't like me now but anyway um I think, look, um, sensationalism, bad news stories, um, all of those things uh, gain attention, sell papers, get clicks. Right. Um, the reality is that that's not really what it's like on the ground. Yes, of course, there's some of that. Yes, there's there's struggles and all the rest of it. What do we see? Uh, what do I see? Um, I have never seen the, the the level of innovation that we see going on right now. There is so much happening out there there is so much technology there is so much so much focus on technology solving real problems and evidence of it happening real problems um, that again uh, get better outcomes for individuals quicker intervention better outcome earlier outcome all of that good stuff and create capacity and again i think this is this is a necessity that the crisis that the media loves to talk about well that is the mother of invention Right. Um, what we see is, is invention everywhere. I'm looking at businesses all the time with invention. And indeed, we've got a, a whole roster of, um, of partner organizations that we work with who have got you know, wonderfully inventive tools out there that solve um, sometimes big problems, sometimes very niche problems. 
But either way, they're, they're problems that need solving and, and have an impact on people's lives. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Obviously, I see it as well from the innovation side. And, you know, we work across the country with a number of NHS trusts and organizations from community through to, you know, larger areas. And there's there's a massive, massive delta between and I'm not saying what's perpetrated, what, what's in the media is wrong, because obviously there's a lot of statistics that are, I presume, true, although I've not fact checked them myself around backlogs and, yeah. di- you know, different things. I, I, I would assume that that stuff is is sort of empirically true. But it's also empirically true that there's more effort than ever, I suspect, going into solving the issues, I would think. Yeah, no, I, I definitely. That's that's definitely what what we see. Um, and, you know, this is this is if you work in this area, in this sector, you do it because you care. You do it because, yes. you, you know, it has I real agree. meaning. Um, and so the level of passion and expertise um, is is amazing. It really is amazing. So that's that's what makes it a very exciting area to be in. It's exciting technology, solving real problems, making millions of people's lives better. And that's, you know, that's what, what I do. What can you do so, yeah, I can't speak for others. So let's um, let's talk a little bit about your charity work. So what is what is SNAP? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, yeah, I'm proud to to recently become a trustee of SNAP Special Needs and Parents. Um, It is a charity which um, serves community in Essex. Um, And uh, I've been involved with them for about 10 years and seen the work that they do uh, firsthand. And um, SNAP really provides support to to parents, to to families, to to carers of children aged 0 to 25 um, who have some form of of, uh, disability or, or special need within that. And really the focus of SNAP, where it's perhaps different to some, is it's very much about supporting the whole family, supporting, you know, the the clues in the title and parents at Mm. the end of it. So supporting parents to help them get the information they need, uh, gain the resilience that they need, uh, know where to find the services that they need, because it's it's a pretty hard and, and emotional place to work. So um snap as i say is is uh in its 30th anniversary year wow that's um, a long run it's brilliant yeah absolutely brilliant wow. um, provides services to i think over 4000 families a year wow. um so it's a, it's great reach within that within a you know a, a, uh, within the county um and it ranges from library services helplines and you know some of the things that come in are, are are truly heartbreaking people in crisis that just need guidance help they need to know where to go so is that is is it a form of of social prescribing or is it not really uh well in in a sense you you could certainly feel that you might be referred in that area for information for support certainly yes yeah um and indeed uh so yes people will be referred to snap and indeed snap refers out to where where people can find services and there's a a library and and all sorts of lectures and and tours and preschool and after school clubs and summer clubs and and all sorts of things that really just i think the key for me is is supporting everybody it's yes it's supporting the young person but it's the family at the end of the day have to have the resilience and the knowledge to be able to look after that individual and to advocate for them and that's yeah you know that's one of the hardest things and how much has has um Again, I don't know. I don't know much, if anything, about that particular sector. So apologies if if I'm sort of slightly clumsy with the way I phrase this. But how much? Again, and this is partly influenced by uh, stories that I may have read around um, uh, reduction, dramatic reduction in funding, NHS funding, government funding, council funding, local authority funding for parents and children with special needs. Yeah, uh, uh, and is more being shoved off onto effectively charities to deal with. At, and and therefore private donors in order to fund yeah. those charities uh, and sort of I I think so I think I, I talk from some sort of uh, personal experience here and, and my knowledge with with SNAP um, my my rather than other disabilities the the bigger area that that I have knowledge of is around uh, autism spectrum disorder so ASD and ADHD etc and certainly it has become much much harder to go through the process of. Uh, getting an educational health and care plan, of accessing school-based services and school support. There, there is a, 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 I don't want to say there is the program of trying to reduce that, but there is right. finite funds. Um, you've got finite funds at the same time as there being much greater understanding 
of the needs that are out there in the community. Right. Um, and so I think you've got a, a growth in need or understanding of the need coupled with finite funds. And that means, yes, you've got to access services in a different way. And how much, so there was a story on the BBC News this morning around an announcement of sort of record levels of absenteeism amongst children of school age. And, and they think it was, they, I think they said it was, it's one in three doesn't attend school regularly. And they, no, sorry, it's one in five. And they think it's going to go to one in four when they republish um, the, um, when they republish the, uh, the statistics, I think in a month or two. Yeah. And, and how much of that um, overlaps with, lack of school-based as you said provision for certain um issues conditions um disabilities needs there is undoubtedly overlap to it undoubtedly i think the situation is better than it used to be when you know when i was a, a kid um the naughty kid that used to sit in the corner because they used to jump around a lot or chat inappropriately or didn't engage or whatever Nowadays, we might well identify and say, you know what, actually, there are some underlying issues there. I think there's better understanding of that now. So it's better in that way. But certainly there's there's uh, enough teachers and schools out there that don't understand the problem or deal with it enough. And that will, that will lead to stress and that will lead to anxiety and that will lead to kids who do not want to go in, do not engage, cannot engage. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in that area. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I would agree. Um, so um, just in the last bit of the show, if people want to find out about SNAP, where would they go? Uh, they can go to snapcharity.org. Snapcharity.org. Snapcharity. And um, that's the end of the show. We've come to the end. So, Steve, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yep. And thanks to everyone for listening. And we will be back again next week with a new show. So thank you very much, everyone. This was our first show back in 2024.